Agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And we turn now to topical questions. We start with question number one from Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the BBC programme, A Force in Crisis, alleging that in 2014 the Chief Constable's Office suggested edits to a critical report on culture and ethos at Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Yesterday evening's BBC documentary explored a number of issues relating to the leadership and delivery of policing in the initial period following the establishment of Police Scotland. The matters raised, many of which are historic legacy force issues inherited by the single service, are primarily for Police Scotland to address. I welcome the steps taken by the Scottish Police Authority to seek urgent assurances from the service in relation to the issues raised through the BBC programme and note their commitment to addressing these matters through the appropriate governance and assurance routes. The Scottish Police Authority Board is due to next meet on Wednesday of this week, where it will discuss ongoing efforts to transform policing in Scotland. That transformation is delivering an increasingly outward focused, outward outcome focused model of policing, improved emphasis on officer and staff wellbeing, and a continued focus on professional standards and ethics, all of which attracted comment in yesterday's programme. The changes being taken forward will allow the service to build on the significant progress which has been made in recent times, whether that be in relation to the more ethical use of stop and search as a police tactic, the strengthening of Police Scotland's anti-corruption practices, or the delivery of targeted activities to support well-being across the service. It's clear that the issues previously encountered in each of these areas predate Police Scotland, and I'm confident that the establishment of a single command structure, coupled with the enhanced oversight arrangements delivered through police reform, have aided the improvements we have seen. I welcome the continued focus that Police Scotland has placed on ethics and professional standards throughout this process. This was recently demonstrated through the establishment of a new executive portfolio of professionalism and assurance, which is headed by an assistant Chief Constable. I'm committed to supporting both Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority as they continue this important work. Ensuring public confidence in policing remains strong going forward. Liam Kerr. Presiding Officer, I think people watching this today will feel that the Cabinet Secretary's answers aren't really good enough. This is a scandal, and I do not use that word lightly. It appears that the head of our national police force has engaged in a deliberate cover-up of allegations of corruption and changed the tenses of other problems to suggest they were already fixed. People and their trust in their employer make our police force what it is. Yet it is alleged that an entire section of the report entitled Culture of Fear was retitled, redacted and rescripted. This goes to the very top, but people will want to know how far. So I ask, when did the Cabinet Secretary first learn about the problems identified and the whitewash, and if the answer is in the last 48 hours, doesn't that rather suggest he isn't on top of his brief? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, the member will be aware that the report is uh, almost uh, four years old. It was an internal Police Scotland report, uh, which uh, was considered internally within uh, the police service. Um, the member makes reference to the actions of the not previous Chief Constable, but the Chief Constable for them, Sir Stephen House in the changes which were made to that particular uh, report. What I would expect is that in a report of this nature that there would be appropriate oversight by the Scottish Police Authority and how Police Scotland are taking forward these matters. But it is worth picking up on some of the issues which were highlighted particularly within that particular report, part of which was in relation to corruption, which I believe the member was referring to in relation to this Tayside uh, force, the previous legacy uh, force before Police Scotland was created something which I understand was investigated by the Crown Office at that particular point and looked at. It made reference to the way in which the counter-corruption unit had been operating. The member clearly isn't aware of the fact that HMICS undertook an assurance review of the counter-corruption unit within Police Scotland and published its report back in 2016. Within that report, it made some 39 different recommendations, all of which were accepted by Police Scotland. As a result, it changed its model on how it was dealing with anti-corruption issues. One of the things that's now happening, which the member I'm surprised as a justice spokesperson isn't aware of, is that HMICS 
are about to produce an update review of the progress that Police Scotland have made in these issues. Another aspect that the report highlighted was the culture of fear, particularly around targets, in dealing with targets around a range of different issues, including of that in stop and search. We set up the independent oversight group, the advisory group to look at stop and search, which was headed by John Scott QC, set out a range of recommendations. As a consequence, we now have the new code of practice for stop and search, something which was approved by the Justice Committee in this Parliament as a significant step forward in changing the culture around the use of stop and search. And as a result, we no longer have the target culture that the report made reference to. So the member doesn't seem to recognise is that in a range of different areas, significant progress has been made and continues to be made, be made. And what I am assured of is that the Scottish Police Authority have given a very clear indication to Police Scotland is they want an urgent update on the actions which have been taken forward that have been highlighted within this particular report and they will then take that through their appropriate assurance mechanism. The member will recognise that the Scottish Police Authority are the body that's responsible for the oversight of the police service. And that's exactly what they intend to do in this particular issue. Liam Kerr. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary seems very clear on what he thinks I'm aware of, but I'm not sure we got an answer to the question of what the Cabinet Secretary was aware of uh, in relation to these issues and when. Perhaps someone else will pick up on that. Presiding Officer, an early draft of the report claimed that throughout Police Scotland conducted itself uh, using unauthorised surveillance, threatened and intimidated witnesses, unlawfully detained subjects, colluded on witness statements and failed to reveal evidence. And there was also a culture of fear. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether he is aware if any or all of these allegations are true? And in any event, will he be ordering a full and forensic investigation into the report, its original findings, and ensure that those who created this situation, and indeed those who may have tried to hide it, are fully held to account? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Senator Officer, I've just mentioned how the matter is going to be taken forward, and it will be taken forward by the Oversight Body for Policing in Scotland, and as the Scottish Police Authority, and that they have asked for urgent assurance from Police Scotland on the issues highlighted within this particular report. The member will be aware that this was an internal Police Scotland uh, report. Uh, there's no record uh, that officials have of the report having been shared with the Scottish Government, uh, uh, with myself or uh, previously. Uh, so that, on that basis, it was an internal report that was taken forward by uh, Police Scotland. It is a report which I do think, in terms of the outcomes of it, they should have shared with the, they should have shared with the, uh, they should have shared with the, uh, the Scottish Police Authority. So the important thing here is for the service to move forward. And as I've mentioned, in a number of the areas that have been highlighted, particularly within this particular report, is that that's a matter at uh, which significant progress has been made on a range of different areas. And what I would hope uh, that in going forward, that the Scottish Police Authority will make sure that the issues which were highlighted in the report have been appropriately addressed by the Scottish Police uh, Service and that they address these issues in a way that people can have confidence in the, the way in which they manage these matters. I have four more members wish to ask supplementaries, so please keep the supplementaries relatively brief and the answers similarly. Daniel Johnson. Well, first of all, can I begin by expressing my disappointment that we're not having a full statement, because this is an extremely serious matter. And while the Cabinet Secretary went to some length to explain how these matters have concluded, what he didn't say is make, or make any comment on was the action of suppression of key allegations in the report itself. Because this was an action taken in the very early days of Police Scotland. So what does it say about the organisation's culture and ethos that these were some of the very first acts of the Chief Constable? And is the Cabinet Secretary confident that no such manipulation of reports or suppression of evidence of wrongdoing has taken place since? And finally, let's return to the original question. When did he first become aware of this? Was it before last night? And if so, why has he not brought, brought this before Parliament before now? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, the nature of the uh, report which the BBC published in this matter was brought to my attention when they published information relating to their programme uh, and the uh, fact that they were focusing on this particular report. And as I've already mentioned, uh, the report has not been shared with the Scottish Government and it's not something we have a record of having ever uh, received. And it predates myself when I was in office in the first place. Can I say to him in relation to the uh, uh, content of this particular report, it is a report that I do think Police Scotland at that time should have shared with the Scottish Police Authority. So the Scottish Police Authority had an opportunity to look at these issues and I think it's been a mistake on their part not to do so. Uh, and they should have done so at that particular uh, point. What I would expect is in going forward is that the Scottish Police Authority are very clear with Police Scotland in internal reports of this nature where 
issues of concern are being highlighted, that they should be brought to the attention of the Scottish Police Authority, who are the appropriate body that have oversight of these matters. And that's what I would expect to happen in the future, should any report of this nature be brought forward by Police Scotland. Rona Mackay to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the progress Police Scotland has made since its creation is re reflected by high public confidence in the police and the lowest crime rate in 43 years? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Presiding Officer, there is significant progress that's been made by Police Scotland. As I mentioned in my, uh, in my response to uh, Liam Kerr's question on this matter, is that many of the issues which are highlighted in that report, including the actions of the counter-corruption unit, uh, also issues around the use of targets, particularly around matters such as stop and search, are issues that have been addressed and taken forward. Uh, and the structure, for example, issues about staff not feeling as though their well-being has been addressed. There's a significant amount of work that's been taken forward within the service to address issues of welfare and well-being. Actually, something which uh, the DCC, uh, at DCC Livingston has been absolutely key and instrumental in taking forward within the force to make sure that they are appropriately uh, addressed more effectively and has put in place a whole range of measures to address these matters. And where there have been issues in relation to uh, questions about uh, illegal actions, my understanding is at that time uh, that the matters were referred to the Crown Office for them to consider these uh, issues in relation to uh, the legacy uh, forces. Uh, but I'm sure members will also recognise is that the nature and findings of this report and the title, Force in Crisis, is not reflective of where Police Scotland is today. And it's certainly not reflective of the dedication and hard work of thousands of police officers and staff, day in, day out, who work tirelessly to keep our communities safe. I, in my view, believe that that title in itself does a disservice, uh, does a disservice to uh, those who work hard to keep our communities safe, day in, day out. And I want to take this opportunity to thank them for doing so. John Finney, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, uh, thank you, Sergeant Officer. I, I share the Cabinet Secretary's view. That title is, is a, a fiction. It's a fiction. I think we need to take reassurance on the serious criminal accusations that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service intervened in respect of these in the legacy Tayside. I take some reassurance from uh, the police authority continuing an interest in this. But th there seems to be a marked unwillingness from colleagues uh, to move on in issues. A, a lot of this is rehash of things that if you care to look into, Mr. Kerr, you'll see that uh, the Justice Committee or indeed the Police Committee have looked at. But I just wonder, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary, w when there's, an, uh, there's not one unsolved murder during the life of Police Scotland, when organised crime has been tackled and there was a significant conviction recently there for uh, very, very vicious people working on in an international basis, and when victims of sexual crime, my colleagues don't seem to want to listen to this, when victims of sexual crime have growing confidence in the police service. Eh, I have confidence in the police. We will continue to scrutinise. Do you have confidence in the police, Scotland? Cameron no, Secretary. So the member, I think, he made a number of important points. And I do recognise that the members weren't wanting to listen to him no, because it was were. good news. Because, as ever, when it comes to the opposition parties in here, they're not here to support the police service. They're here to kick it when they can. And every opportunity, they take that opportunity. And uh, it's reflective of the standard, the standard that we've come to expect from justice spokespersons within the opposition benches uh, these days. What I can say, though, is that the member is correct, is that there is no unsolved murders. Uh, would you call it, since Police Scotland has been created, there's been significant progress made in tackling issues around uh, serious and organised crime. And the recent uh, conviction of nine individuals at Glasgow High Court is a, a clear example of the very significant progress we've been able to make, particularly with a single command structure, in giving clear focus to tackling uh, these types of very significant serious and organised crime groups, um, who are not just significant here in Scotland, but internationally uh, are significant uh, within the organised crime uh, sector. And that in itself, I believe, is a demonstration of the very real benefits that have come from uh, the way in which the service is addressing these issues. And I've got absolutely no doubt going forward that the service will continue to make improvements. There are areas where there continues to be challenges, areas where they will want to continue to make improvements uh, and address issues of concern going forward. But I've got absolutely no doubt that the service is moving in the right, di right direction. And the reason it's moving in the right direction is because of the dedication and the commitment of those thousands of men and women each day, uh, officers and staff who do everything in their power to make sure they're keeping our communities safe. And I have every confidence in them. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have to say I take some exception of accusations of opposition members doing police down when, with the exception of the last two questions, we have actually been holding this government to account. <laughs> Up until yesterday, 
Up until yesterday, it was clear that this review was still being kept secret by Police Scotland. Indeed, the police rejected a freedom of information request for it five weeks ago. Isn't the real reason that Scottish ministers have shown no interest in obtaining the original of this report because it's, it calls into question the effectiveness of their centralisation of power in the police and indeed their toothless police authority? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't agree with that, uh, Sign Officer, for the very reason is that the actual report was highlighting, uh, to a large extent, issues that related to conduct in previous legacy forces, which I think, I'm sure if the member gave con proper consideration to this, would probably raise some serious doubts about the quality of oversight of what was going on in those previous legacy forces in addressing some of these issues, uh, which Police Scotland has inherited and is having to deal with. Uh, and what I can assure him of is, as I said out in my original answer, the Scottish Police Authority are very clear uh, that they want uh, urgent assurances from Police Scotland uh, on the issues that were raised within this particular report and that they're being addressed and have been addressed within the service. And I made reference to a number of the areas that uh, progress has been made on. So, for example, the issue of stop and searches. Former colleague Alison McInnes was at the forefront of demanding the way in which we needed to change the way in which uh, stop and search was addressed. Someone who made a very positive contribution to the policing debate and trying to change policing uh, and to improve the way in which it operated within our society. And that is a legacy which is reflected in the change. And part of the report was highlighting some of the issues around the, the culture of uh, targets which were set and the culture of fear that that created. And part of that was driven by the targets around uh, stop and search, something which has now changed uh, very significantly. So I can assure the member is that progress has been made in a number of these different areas, which, uh, which got, it's a matter for the producers to decide on whether they wish to reflect that in the course of uh, the programme that they uh, produced. But I mentioned several of them here uh, today already, which were referenced in this particular uh, report. And I've got no doubt that the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland will want to continue to drive forward these improvements in the months and years ahead. Thank you. Question number two, Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what process it will use to monitor the effectiveness of the pricing per unit of alcohol. Cabinet Secretary Shula Robertson. Well, uh, today is truly a landmark day as Scotland becomes the first country worldwide to introduce minimum unit pricing for alcohol. NHS Health Scotland is leading the monitoring and evaluation plan for minimum unit pricing. The plan involves an extensive portfolio of research examining a number of areas, including implementation and compliance, price and product range, alcohol sales and consumption, alcohol-related harm, economic impact on the industry and attitudes to minimum price. Some studies will be carried out by NHS Health Scotland and others commissioned. An overarching governance board and evaluation advisory group for the individual studies has been established. For some studies, baseline data collection has already been completed. I look forward to seeing the data from the evaluation programme as we embark on this next phase of our journey to tackle Scotland's relationship with alcohol. Ashton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. With the intention of minimum unit pricing being part of a wider health policy, can the Cabinet Secretary set out the number of lives that it's hoped will be saved as a result of its implementation? Cabinet Secretary. I can uh, tell uh, Ash Denham that the, the University of Sheffield modelling estimates that if a minimum unit price of 50 pence was introduced in the first year, there would be 58 fewer alcohol-related deaths and uh, almost 1,300 fewer alcohol-related hospital admissions. And over a five-year period, we could expect 392 fewer alcohol-related deaths during that period and 8,254 fewer alcohol-related hospital admissions. Uh, for some illnesses that are associated with drinking alcohol, it may take a longer time to see the full benefit of drinking less. And we believe it will take probably 20 years for all of the benefits of the policy uh, to be realised. But there will be substantial progress made over that period of time. Ash Denham. Could the Cabinet Secretary outline if this model that Scotland has now introduced is one that other countries are looking at and that other countries are possibly considering implementing themselves? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the, the member may be aware that the Welsh Assembly introduced legislation for a minimum unit pricing of alcohol in October 2017, and Ireland are also looking at the, the policy. I understand that the Australian uh, Northern Territories are currently considering a minimum floor price for alcohol. 
I think minimum unit pricing is a landmark policy that is getting, gaining interest uh, across the world and I think other countries are watching Scotland with interest and I would certainly hope that uh, all other parts of the UK uh, will eventually follow suit and I know that certainly among the health uh, professions and certainly the Chief Medical Officer uh, in England I think is a, a, a supporter of this and I think that there will be uh, growing voices for other parts of the UK to follow suit. I'm conscious that we're well over time but if the members will be brief I'll take two front bench questions. Miles Briggs. Will the assessment process give any consideration to a banded minimum unit price approach, which was highlighted by the Centre for Economics and Business Research in their recent report and was, was submitted to the Scottish Government's consultation on price? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we, um, as I've said before, we will keep price under review, but I think it is important to establish the evidence based on the 50 pence uh, price. But obviously, as the evaluation uh, uh, goes forward, we will, of course, keep uh, price uh, under review and uh, that's something we will come back to look at. But what's important now, though, is that we get on with the implementation of the policy. And in that hour. Officer, in monitoring the effectiveness of MUP, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to look at two other areas? One, the downward trend in terms of investment in alcohol and drug partnerships and the impact that has on our alcohol strategy. And secondly, where the money goes. So would we look at having a social responsibility levy so that additional resource that comes from MUP doesn't go to supermarket profits, but instead can be invested in our NHS and in support services? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, it's good to finally see uh, Labour supporting uh, this, this policy. Uh, it is an important policy and uh, he will be aware, as I've said already, that the uh, evaluation process will, of course, capture where any uh, revenues land because they could land in a number of different places and uh, that will be monitored as part of the evaluation process. I've explained why uh, this would not be the right time to introduce a public health supplement or a social responsibility levy, which, of course, was aimed at addressing local circumstances uh, rather than minimum unit pricing. But again, of course, we'll keep that under review. And in terms of alcohol and drug um, spending alcohol and drug partnerships, um, I would have thought Anasara would have been aware that the budget included uh, £20 million of additional spend for alcohol and drug partnerships, something unfortunately that he voted against. Thank you. That concludes topical questions. We'll turn now to a statement by Marie Todd on the agreement of multi year funding package for expansion of funded early, earning, early learning and childcare. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement and I would uh, encourage any member who wishes to ask a question of the Minister to press their request to speak buttons.